Without further ado, please help me welcome to the stage Honorary Chair Gitanjali Takor. Good morning, everyone. Hope you all are enjoying the conference as much as I am. My name is Gitanjali Thakur, and I'm a business owner. I'm the owner of Encore Consulting. Encore provides consulting services to the federal government. It has been an honor to sponsor this event. It is my honor to introduce the first keynote speaker of the day. The Honorable Setu Raman Panchanathan is a computer scientist and engineer and the 15th director of the U.S. National Science Foundation, NSF. NSF is a $9.5 billion independent federal agency and the only government agency charged with advancing all fields of scientific discovery, technological innovation, and STEM education. Dr. Panchanathan has a distinguished career in science, technology, engineering, and education that spans more than three decades. He served as executive vice president of the Arizona State University Knowledge Enterprise, where he also founded the Center for Cognitive Ubiquitous Computing. Prior to becoming director of NSF, Panchanathan served on the National Science Board for six years and, he, and has also served on and chaired numerous high-level research and innovation organizations. He's a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors, the American Association for the Adva Advancement of Science, the Association for Computing Machinery, and other prestigious science and engineering organizations. Dr. Panchanathan's scientific contributions have advanced the areas of human-centered multimedia computing, haptic user interfaces, person-centered ubiquitous computing technologies for empowering individuals with a range of abilities. With that, I welcome Dr. Panchanathan onto the stage. Thank you, Gita. How are you? Good morning to all of you. I hope that people out there are able to hear well, because I was told the acoustics in the room is not as good as it could be. But usually people fear to mic me because they don't need, they feel that I cause headaches because of my level of volume naturally. I know yesterday was a very good party, so very few people are ready to get up and say, why do I have to listen to this fellow at 8.30 a.m.? So I'm glad those of you who actually came really thought there is something that will get out of that you'll get out of it, and hopefully that will be the case. My name is uh, Punch. That's how people call me. And um, what I wanted to share with you today is the journey of NSF a little bit. Most importantly, a reflection a little bit, but then prospectively where we are going into the future. For those of you who may not know about NSF, many do, but some don't. I will give you a quick thumbnail of that too. When I came to NSF more than three years ago, three and a half years ago, I had come with a set of experiences. We all do this in our roles. We come with our own set of experiences, observations, and things of that nature. To me, my experiences led me to believe, which I still hold dearly, is that opportunities should be for everyone in our country. Opportunity should be for everyone not only in the United States, Dean is smiling. Opportunity is not only for everyone in the United States, but for everyone across the globe. And this is not the responsibility of one or the other. It's a shared responsibility of all of us. That's the first belief. And what NSF can do to advance that opportunity everywhere for everyone, the first thing that I wanted to make sure that we focused on, not that we were not focused on that, but to intensify, to be intentional about it in terms of how we move forward. The second thing, I I'm convinced that innovation can happen anywhere across our country. 
It is not necessarily limited to a few locations. As important as they are, we all know that, and some of you, I think, are part of that and making and shaping all of that, for which we are very grateful. Whether it is Silicon Valley, whether it is Kendall Square, whether it is Austin, Texas, or anywhere across the nation where you don't have to even blink an eyelid to know, yes, of course, innovation is thriving there. But the question that remains is, should innovation be constrained, in a sense, to only those locations? Is innovation possible anywhere across our nation? And I firmly believe the answer is yes to that again. And there are many examples I can give you, either during this presentation or in a Q&A forum. So when I took this role, therefore, I wanted to emphasize this concept of opportunities everywhere, innovation anywhere. And how do you do that? Through this unbelievable thread of science, technology, engineering, innovation, and more. How do we make that happen? How do we unleash these possibilities everywhere? As the president talks about possibilities. How do we unleash these possibilities everywhere? And that's what I'm going to be sharing with you in a quick form today. And I hope all of you get a chance to see that. I, I want this to be projected. Yeah, good, very good. So before I get any further, I said I will give you a quick thumbnail about NSF. The great thing about NSF, the National Science Foundation, it is the agency in the United States that is responsible for making possible discoveries, innovations, translations, workforce development, all across the nation, on all fields of science and engineering. The only agency that is responsible for that. And this was created in 1950, but in 1945, Vannevar Bush wrote this beautiful treatment called Science, the Endless Frontier, to then President Roosevelt, and said, coming out of World War II, how might we make sure that this nation continues this journey of exploration and discoveries, making possible amazing innovations? And how might that happen through federal government also emphasizing, influencing, and investing in that objective? And that led to the formation through an act of Congress in 1950, the formation of the National Science Foundation, with a simple mission, which is how can we make sure that we can promote the progress of science, advance the national health, prosperity, and welfare, and secure the national defense. Now, this pretty much is all encompassing. And the mission statement is so good that for 75 years, you didn't have to rewrite the mission statement. These days, every leader comes, they will write their own mission and vision statement. This has stood the test of time and will stand the test of time because this is comprehensive in terms of what we can, should, and must do all across the nation. So when you look at this mission statement, therefore, how do you actualize this mission statement? As I said, when I came to NSF, I said there are three major activities that we need to engage in. The first one, the first one is how do you strengthen the established NSF? Let's talk about established NSF. NSF has made possible thus far investing early in the careers of scientists, engineers, and researchers, 262 Nobel laureates. There is no agency on earth, no agency on earth planet Earth that has this level of accomplishment, 262 Nobel laureates, but who's counting, as they would say? Not just Nobel laureates in physics or chemistry, as important as they are, biology, as important as it is in medicine, but also in economics. In fact, I write congratulatory notes to Nobel laureates every year after the prize is announced, because every year they would have NSF triad tracks. In fact, the Nobel laureate in economics this time, Claudia from Harvard, wrote back to me, and this is what Nobel laureates write back to me immediately. They will say, Punch, on the other hand, thank you, meaning thank NSF, because that gave us the start. That invested in our high-risk ideas early in our career, and then subsequently sustained investments over the career, that here we are doing the things that we are doing. And it is gratifying, gratifying to see that that mission of NSF is still vibrant, thriving, and doing very well. And I'm going to talk about the other mission of NSF, manifestation of NSF, in a moment, in a different way in which I've started to articulate it, and you'll get to see that too, and I will talk about the other mission in a minute. 
So therefore, it is very clear. It is very clear, therefore, that there is a need to strengthen this established NSF, if that's what you want to call it. And do that at speed and scale. So that's the first objective, is to make sure, as they say, don't break anything that is, you know, that is all good, okay? So make sure that you are doubling down, tripling down, and enhancing that mission. On top of that, I wanted to make sure that we were with intentionality and intensity, engaging in a few other things that I believe are exceedingly important for this moment in time. And the first of those is literally the central pillar of the vision. The central pillar of the vision is, I believe that there are missing millions of talented people that don't even get a chance, that don't even get a chance to exercise their talent. This is not just in the United States. This is true in India too. And in every nation and leaders that I speak to. How do we inspire these missing millions of talent so they too can express their talent in the fullest form? And how do we get that done? So inspiring the missing millions. What do you do about it? And we're going to talk a little bit about that too. And the third an important priority is as we do this, how do we accelerate technology and innovation? Innovation, as I said, everywhere and anywhere across our nation. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that too. So these are the strategic priorities that we have embarked upon. And the timing of this is exceedingly important, and I will come to that in a minute. So when I came to NSF, I said, how do I articulate this for people so that they can see this mission of NSF as important as the fundamental basic discoveries are. People often think that NSF is all about black hole discoveries, as important as it is. Or some nanoparticle in its very early stages of conceptualization, as important as it is. But NSF is not just that. So I said, how do I articulate this? And so I said, I made up this term, the DNA of NSF. The DNA of NSF has two strands. The first strand, is what we call curiosity-driven, discovery-based, exploratory research. And NSF is fantastic at this. I just articulated at least one manifestation of that in the 262 Nobel laureates that we talked about. But the other mission of NSF is which is strongly intertwined with this mission of curiosity-driven, discovery-based explorations is what I call use-inspired, solutions-focused translations or innovations. What do we have to show for in that context? Well, it turns out that two graduate students, Larry Page and Serge Gibran, supported by NSF, wrote a proposal to NSF in 1994 for a digital libraries project. NSF funded that. Five years later, when they submitted the final report, they said, we founded a company called Google a year earlier. And the rest is a trillion dollar history. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of such companies that have found their tire tracks back to NSF. And even more importantly, for those of you who are touched by NSF here, you are that exemplar of NSF, which is the talent that has been expressed through you, that you are transforming the science, technology, engineering, innovation enterprises in your, in your own way, each one of you. That's the greatest asset of NSF. So this symbiotic nature of curiosity-driven, discovery-based, and use-inspired, solutions-focused, they are not part of a pipeline, as people would like you to believe. Yes, there may be in some cases. You do basic research, applied research, translation research, industry licenses the intellectual property, or a spin-off happens because of that. Yeah, that's true, but oftentimes, that translational outcome demands more fundamental research, inspires more fundamental research. This is a highly symbiotic, synergistic activity. And that's why I chose to represent this in this form of a highly synergistic DNA representation of what the DNA of NSF is all about. So that you get the picture. But NSF is always known to be the best kept secret. I'm sure many of you are saying, ah, oh, I didn't know about that. So that's why I decided to play not only the role of how do we advance fundamental discoveries and so on, but become an evangelist. Hope I'm doing a reasonable job on that. One of the first objective 
is how do we ensure that the future of research, innovation, and technology is inspired by NSF. And I'm so grateful to President Biden, Biden-Harris administration, and the entire Congress in a bipartisan way, supporting the Chips and Science Act, which is going to have significant investments. When I came into NSF, I immediately started working with Congress, with the administration, to see how NSF can be seen as something that needs to be invested in in a significant way so that we might unleash this vision of innovation anywhere and opportunities everywhere. And I'm proud to say that this collective energy, the moment, and people often bemoan, I was just talking to somebody outside in the backstage, oh, but that's a bipartisan issue. No, no, quite the contrary. I have walked the halls of Congress, I do that all the time. I'm traveling with senators and congressmen and women on all sides. There is no question about science, technology, and innovation as important for the nation, and that it needs to make sure that it unleashes possibilities and therefore makes prosperity possible. And most importantly, that is the vehicle by which we can ensure that we are outcompeting anyone and make possibilities for everyone across the globe. There is no dearth of that. If you have any questions about that, drop it. I know there are a lot of cynics out there. And I tell them, drop it. This is the time to see what we can do to leverage this moment to do great things rather than sulk and talk about what could not be done or cannot be done or you think cannot be done. This is not the time in the nation to do that. Be a Dean Cayman. Inspire the youth. Make the K-12 excited about robotics. Be the people that causes the change without giving up to that pessimism and cynicism. So therefore, I'm grateful for this Chips and Science Act that was signed on, signed on in 2022. And in Chips and Science, there were some technology priorities that were outlined. But we were also given the dimension of making sure that we are constantly looking at newer technology horizons newer technology horizons, and updating this. This is just a list for you, as Chips and Science articulated it. But this is just an example, or an exemplar list, not an exhaustive list. Somebody's very happy out there. So, maybe because they're saying, thank God I didn't go to this noisy session. So, um, if you look at these, if you look at these technology areas, I am going to not go into every one of them, but I could go into every one of them but I'm going to stay with one or two of them, just to again show the exemplar nature of these. Let's pick AI because everybody talks about AI. I heard Ar Arvind talked about AI yesterday. So let's talk about AI. What has NSF done to advance the possibilities of today in terms of AI? The collective investments of NSF just in the last year is over $800 million in AI. I want people to be reminded I want people to be reminded that AI of today is because of sustained investments of NSF and a few other agencies over the last five to six decades. NSF did not give up. Even in AI winters, NSF persisted, invested, hyper-invested. What people are talking about AI today is made because of that kind of a vision looking into the horizon and investing and hyper-investing. Today, we are investing like that in many other technologies for which we don't even know the labels yet. The labels will come, but that's the job of NSF. Quantum, hyper-invested in quantum for several decades. Now it's talked about. Of course, we are continuing to invest in quantum. Biotech, all of these have fingerprints, thumbprints, footprints, all kinds of prints back to NSF. If I had my iPhone, I would show you. Kim has it, she's holding it. So if I hold up the iPhone, there are probably tens of thousands of NSF projects on an iPhone, including the glass that covers the iPhone. That's what basic research does. That's what translation of the basic research into advanced technologies does. This is not as well understood. That's why I'm belaboring this point. So you see all the focus areas, therefore. When you look at an investment, 
It is not just about only discoveries. It's about education. It's about ideas. It's about infrastructure. It's about innovations. It's about technologies. It's about translation. It's about workforce training. NSF invests in all those forms. Sometimes as NSF, sometimes as not just NSF, but also as partnering with other agencies, other entities across the globe. I'm told that it's time for Q&A, but I was told I can take as much time as I want. And if you all agree, I will continue. Okay? Whoever is the next presenter, too bad. This, in, this idea of AI everywhere, how are we delivering on AI everywhere? When I came to NSF, we launched this concept of this AI institutes. Each institute's $20 million scale. We have 25 of them launched in the last three years to a total of half a billion dollars of investment. And it excites me when I look at every one of these. Only 15 of the 25 is invested in by NSF resources. The other 10 is through partnership resources. That's the other thing, is to bring partners along so they too can invest and co-invest with you. Unleashing possibilities all across the nation. Many, many examples of these institutes. This excites me because this makes possible speech pathology at scale led by University of Buffalo. Or if you look at the NSF investments that we partnered with NIFA, you know, NIFA folks are here. Five AI institutes funded by NIFA on AI for agriculture, advancing AI so that the agriculture future through AI concepts can be unleashing possibilities in terms of efficiency, effectiveness, and ensuring that our food security is absolutely you know, something that we can guarantee. So there are many, many such institutes all across the nation. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip and just talk about these five title agriculture institutes. Again, many possibilities there. Let's take biotechnology as a second example. Let's look at what have we done. Many, many innovations. You know, when you talk about the COVID test that was unfurled in the, in, in the pandemic time, that traces back to a 1960s project of NSF, of a bacteria in Yellowstone National Park that then led to the COVID test, the PCR test, tire tracks again. The discovery of RNA, RNAi in plant-based genomics, and that then leading to the amazing discovery of CRISPR. Let's talk about Jennifer Dudna, the Nobel laureate in 2020 for CRISPR technology. Jennifer was invested in by NSF as an early career award winner. And then one of the most prestigious prizes of NSF every year is called, named in honor of the first director of NSF, Alan T. Waterman. Alan T. Waterman Award, she won that. And then finally won something smaller called Nobel Prize. Today, the precision editing is proliferate in every dimension including the COVID vaccines that you talked about, the tests that you talked about. These are things that makes possible the biotechnology innovations. So when we talk about innovation anywhere, therefore, there are many, many examples of that that we can talk about. One of the programs that we have at NSF, which was actually incubated at NSF, is a Small Business Innovation Research, or SBIR programs. Now it's in other agencies. Little do people know that it was actually incubated at NSF in 80s. When Witterby came and said that he wanted to take his algorithm and build a company, NSF invested through the SBAR program. Now it's a couple hundred billion dollar company called Qualcomm. So the SBAR program has invested in thousands of companies, at least 4,500, but who's counting? Several billion dollars of follow-on investments by venture capital. I'm going to give you one example of a story. I'm a storyteller. So here is an example. Two graduate students, Jason Kelly and Reshma Shetty, were graduate students at MIT, funded by NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program in the early 2000s. Mid-2000s, and they work with their advisors, Tom Knight and Drew Endy. Mid-2000s, NSF releases the engineering research centers which we have all across the nation 
a Sinberg Engineering Center called a Synthetic Biology Engineering Center called Sinberg at MIT in mid 2000s. And these two students were part of the Sinberg Center. A couple of years later, these two students, with their advisor Tom Knight, founded a company called Ginkgo Bioworks. NSF funded it through the SBAR program, phase one, phase 2A, phase 2B. All of that through NSF. And then other agencies, SBAR, got interested too. Now, these two students who co-founded the company, today Ginkgo Bioworks is several billion dollars company operating out of Boston. Now you talk about tire tracks. All the way from the students to the faculty who were funded, to the SBARs that were funded, and where the company is employing more than 1,300 people in Boston. So NSF makes possible unleashing through pathways to entrepreneurship and trying to expand this footprint. So the i program, which is essentially a program that sensitizes people to entrepreneurial mindset. I happen to have an i boot bootcamp myself as an attendee of i boot bootcamp, most humiliating experience I've faced in my life. I was told what I did not know rather than what I knew. And I thought I knew everything. So these programs really make possible thousands of companies, whether it is student-based, postdoc-based, or faculty-based, having their start. Or accelerating public-private partnerships at scale. We have prioritized this at NSF. How do we expand the footprint by hyper-partnering with other agencies, with industry, with entrepreneurial ecosystems, economic development ecosystems, foundation philanthropy, as well as international partnerships? A couple of examples. The Platform for Advanced Wireless Research. 35 companies investing $50 million, the who's who in wireless research. And NSF co-investing with $50 million, a $100 million program, looking at the future of the next generation of wireless networks, as one example. Intel is a great partner. Most recently, with the Chips and Science Act, Intel and NSF joined together in addition to Micron, investing each $10 million to see how we can scale the skill technical workforce all across the nation, as one example. So when I came to NSF, I asked the question, how do I do this, as I said, with intention and intensity? So we, we decided to launch a new directorate at NSF called Technology Innovation Partnership, or the TIP directorate. I thought by the acronym TIP, we can be clever to see how we can tip the scale to our advantage. The TIP directorate is the first new directorate at NSF in 31 years. I said it has got to be launched within a year. The programs are to be launched within 18 months to 24 months. There are eight different programs launched already. And the exemplar program that I really wanted in this TIP directorate is what I call the regional innovation engines. Because as I said, I believe innovation can be anywhere. How do we unearth innovation in every part of the country? I strongly recommend you, because they told me I have only five minutes even despite the extra time. Go to the website on RIE, look at these 44 awards we made on type one, spanning 46 states. Unbelievable projects that you would not even think would be innovative ideas. Whether it is industrial hemp, whether it is mining lithium and processing it in a recycled way. All across the nation, and we're about to announce that is a smaller scale, the large scale type twos, $160 million over 10 years, each of them. We're about to launch 10 of them. Stay tuned. These are going to make possible unbelievable innovation centers all across the nation and working with the Department of Commerce with my good friend, Secretary Armando. How do we make sure that these are scaled and deployed all across the nation so that the industries of the future, the entrepreneurial ventures, and the jobs of the future are ensured in the post-AI world. These awards, as you can see, the type one and type two pretty much span all 50 states of the nation. This is just the type two awards. So the opportunities everywhere. How do we ensure that we deliver on opportunities everywhere? We know that the usual suspect universities do very well in terms of NSF grants, but there are a class of universities that never prevail in the NSF grant success portfolio. How do we change the direction? And it turns out that it is not that ideas are not everywhere. Of course, ideas are everywhere. They may not be at the same scale as in some established institutions. How do we change the dynamic of these ideas to prevailing beyond the gold standard merit review of NSF? We're not trying to lower any standards. 
that would be an insulting thing to, to say to people. It's about lifting people to the standards and above. So we launched a new program when I came to NSF. I said, let's launch a program called Granted, Growing Research Access Through Nationally Transformative Equity and Diversity. If you're good at NSF in something, it is acronyms. This program is essentially the research infrastructure and the research office that established universities are able to provide help to their faculty to be able to write good proposals, find right opportunities, find right partnerships. These infrastructures don't exist in minority serving institutions or research to institutions. How do we change their game? How do we lift them up? So make this virtual research office available to anybody and everybody across the nation who has a good idea. So they too can present the idea in the best possible form that it transcends the gold standard merit review of NSF. And they too can be successful. And we're already seeing phenomenal impact through this process of how do we generate that. Guess what? The students that actually we want unleashed who don't have the opportunities, go to these institutions, community colleges, research to institutions, and minority serving institutions. And to just preach that diversity is important and still remain in the halls of ivory towers is not the solution. How do we actually make a difference? By actually ensuring that you're serious about unleashing possibilities everywhere. And I will finish with the US-India partnership. As we look around the globe, when I came in, there was a skepticism. Are we really closing down? Are we not going to be opening partnerships across the globe? Quite the contrary. When I came in, I said, we will partner with any nation that shares our values and aspirations. Our shared values of scientific open, openness, transparency, reciprocity, research integrity, and respect for intellectual property. Any nation. Any nation that shares these values and aspirations, we would partner with. We have tremendous amount of partnerships. It used to be that the international programs were more augmentations to basic projects. I said, let's build larger con con constructs called global centers in addition to what we are doing. And I'm sure there'll be a panel and Mohan is gonna talk about the India partnership. India is a strategic partner, Japan, UK, Canada, Australia, Korea, New Zealand, you name it, Brazil. It doesn't matter which part of the world, Middle East. But whoever, as I said, ascribes to those values and aspirations, we will partner with them. With India, just in the last two years, we have tremendous amount of projects released with Department of Science and Technology Partnership, Ministry of Information Technology Partnership, Department of Biotechnology Partnership, Department of Telecommunications Partnership, Neeraj, I think, is coming today, and he will talk about that too. I'm sure I probably reflected on this yesterday. Ministry of Earth Sciences. How do you work on quad projects with Japan, Australia, India, and the United States around AI for agriculture? These are things that we have unleashed at hundreds of millions of dollars scale. Let's build expertise and co-create together and co-inspire and make possible innovation and opportunities in all the nations. That's the vision. So I'm very delighted that President Modi and Prime Minister Modi, as part of his state visit, the first stop when he landed from New York was come to NSF. We hosted the Prime Minister and the First Lady, and I ran the panel, a small panel, of the Prime Minister, the First Lady, and two students from each country, with the community college president and the CEO of Micron, to see how we can build a workforce of the future for both nations. We are hyper-partnering, folks. And that means that every one of you can be those ambassadors, can be those people that can enhance this partnership. Let's not rely only on the federal investment as important as they are. Every one of you has a role to play. And the reason I want to be here is not only to talk about NSF, but to hopefully motivate you to be a part of enhancing this partnership. Not just wait in the sidelines and watch and that's great. That's necessary but not sufficient. I implore every one of you, go inside and ask yourself, what can I do? What can I do to make this partnership solid? What can I do to inspire talent here everywhere across our nation? As well as what can I do to see how talent across the nation in India and other nations can be inspired? What can I do? 
to inspire innovation everywhere. <laughs> this is not one agency. It is not one person. It's all of us, a team. We are the team. And how do we get more people recruited to this team? It takes a village, as they say, to get this done. This is the time. The time is now. I know the theme of the, 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 the conference is future is now. I say the time is now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director Panchanatan.